Look, uh, before Kath takes us straight to an hour intensive on Fleetwood Mac, which I know she's <laughs> dying to do, uh, let's go back a little bit before that. Photography and uh, rock photography, was that the boyhood dream? Uh, no, it wasn't. Uh, although, if I'd have thought about it at the time, it would have been. Um, I'm a French chef by trade, which was... Ooh la la. Ooh la la. <laughs> and it was a pretty good trade to be in. I ended up working on P&O cruise lines, SS Oriana, went around the world a few times. Won't be doing that anytime soon. I was going to say, <laughs> you got out at the right time. Yep, got it. Good, good timing. Ended up in Sydney in the early 80s, and without a doubt, Sydney and Australia in general had the greatest live music scene in the world. Mm. Uh, and I was obsessed with music, and I used to go down to the Piccadilly Hotel in King's Cross. Uh, and watched the Divinals before they were signed band and I sort of half knew them and then one day through the haze of drinking I was thinking god that's got to be difficult to take a photograph of a moving person and she was a screaming banshee lights going on and off yeah and so for six months I practiced the art of rock and roll photography on Chrissy Ampler and then one day she said let's have a look at photos and they bought one this is the one of the first, is that right? It is the first. The first. The very first photo I ever sold. She, they bought it, and I think they gave me 20 bucks and a bottle of vodka, and it was their tour poster. Part of what we're doing here with the Reservoir Room is is bringing you know live performance to people when they can't get out. I mean, there, there is something that you just kind of can't get from Absolutely. television specials compared to actually getting out in a venue. Absolutely. When you see a live performance, it's a one-on-one -on -one connection. You're and that performer... It will know whether that audience is happening or not. They, they, mm. yeah, uh, loads of bands, even when they get to the stadiums, they've got tricks to go back. Uh, the Rolling Stones will, if they don't think the audience is connecting, they go into Honky Tonk Woman earlier than they were expecting to, to get the audience back. You've got a great story about hon Honky Tonk Woman. How did that song get written? What happened was uh, Keith in the 70s was on an Australian tour and he disappeared. And it's the famous six days that to this day, no one knows, including Keith in his biography, <laughs> right? Here. And when he came back, he got the riff and he got the lyrics for Honky Tonk Woman. And so who is the black woman that he met? Who and no one knows woman? where he was. So uh, well, that gets us on to the Stones and maybe some of, some of the, the, the bigger kind of acts. How do you jump on to that sort of next level? Basically, the higher you get, the easier it is, because these guys are aware that they want photos. The first time I toured with the Rolling Stones, I was, I was literally going backstage, I've got my laminate, I'm all happy, and I ended up in a dressing room and there's Keith and uh, Ronnie playing pool and I'm introduced to them. And in my head, I'm going, <laughs> but actually I'm going, hi, I'm the tour, I'll be taking a couple of things <laughs> <laughs> cool. Of Playing a call. But it's like, it's fucking Mick and Keith, it's like, <laughs> and strangely, as you got used to them, they'd sort of say, they'd literally say, if I had an idea, they'd say, yeah, let's do that. When we were in Red Square, Moscow, I made a flippant remark in a bar to the manager saying, it's all great, except from where I am, I can't see St. Basil's. Next day, I've got a cherry picker, just for me. So I'm in a cherry picker going up, and I've got the Rolling Stones, and then I've got St. Basil's Amazing. behind. Ask and and they're paying me! <laughs> Tell me about the first time you were ever in a helicopter. a helicopter. So early in my career, this is 86, so I haven't been doing it for very long, and EMI London employed me to shoot Queen at Nebworth. Now, what I didn't know at the time, and what I now know, is that was Queen's last ever concert. They never, ever played again, but no one knew at the time. They played two nights, 240,000 people. There's no two ways about it. Freddie is the greatest frontman I've ever seen. The crowd was predominantly male in, in leather. They weren't a heavy rock band, but they were that way inclined. Walks on stage, comes to the front, he goes, 240,000 men in a field, and I'm gonna fuck every one of you up the ass. And the whole crowd are going, Yay, Freddie! <laughs> There's no other circumstance. Those guys would beat someone up in a pub if someone said that. So talk us through some of the other photos that you've got here. Ozzy Osbourne shot at the uh, Park Hyatt down at Circular Quay. So I'm shooting him for the front cover of Kerrang! Heavy Metal magazine in London, and he's the lead singer of Black Sabbath. I'm in the lobby there. Sharon Osbourne comes in and says, Ozzy won't leave the room. I said, that's fine. I was very much used to shooting on the run. I go into the room. Ozzy couldn't have been more pleasant, it was really nice. We got the shots, he, he, he just lights up the camera. It was really good to shoot. We get on quite well, we've only shooting for about 20 minutes. I know I've got what I need. And I just said to him, it would be really nice to just get one shot with available, like ordinary light rather than my studio light. He said, yeah, yeah, fine. So I opened the curtains and Ozzy just turns around and goes, oh my fucking God, Sharon, you've got to come look at the view. It's the opera house, it's the bridge. They'd been there for three days. We'd never opened the curtains. They'd never opened the curtains. <laughs> Prince of Darkness. Stevie and Jimmy. So I did the I did the Fleetwood Mac tour in uh, 1995, and it was the uh, Behind the Mask tour. But my job was to shoot them. Uh, they wanted a, a band shot, and the manager said, "Go to each dressing room because they all had individual dressing room, and just say to them, oh, you know, uh, this is where we're going to meet. This is where we're going to just shoot.' 
an hour before showtime, went into all the dressing rooms. Chrissy McVie was obviously in charge, said what she was more interested in, said what we're doing, what we're doing, that's all fine. Got to Stevie, told her where it was. She kept saying to me, oh, what gate number is it? And I said, oh, I'm not from Melbourne, it's the tennis centre, but I'll find out where it is. It's near, it's near where you go on stage, it'll be fine. See the manager, he said, have you told her? I said, oh, Stevie was interested in what gate number, I, I don't know. And he goes, what the hell did you tell her? And I said, well, I didn't tell her, I don't know what gate number. He goes, oh, fuck, she thinks she's at the airport, she'll just wander off. And I went, what? <laughs> wander off he said oh sometimes she's sort of taking the, uh, the spinal tap hello cleveland to the next yeah, level yeah, really. yeah. It's, it's it's totally it's totally hello cleveland it's hello where what airport am i at so have we got iggy pop on uh, top of an amp or it, it, that, that photograph there is taken when he was 69 years old and i defy anyone it was on the big day out and everybody else in the big day out was young but he was the performer of the day. Unbelievably great performer. He hasn't worn a shirt since 1973. <laughs> and, he got his, and he got his dick out on stage on a regular basis. He's oh, very proud of his willy. Bless him. All right, we've got a really great, really great story about Madonna. That's the Blonde Ambition tour. I got Which hired. Shot. I got hired to shoot that. And uh, at some point, I had to meet Madonna in a lobby of a hotel somewhere. First thing she said to me is, uh, you don't look much like a photographer. And I said, you don't much look like a rock and roll star. Oh! And we a strange way to resign, isn't <laughs> it? Yeah. It's a really <laughs> We didn't have way. a lot of conversations after that. <laughs> yeah, well, Not strange. I do need to talk about Michael well, Hutchins. Well, Michael Hutchins couldn't have been a nicer guy. Great front man, the whole bit. Kylie and Nick Cave. There's an odd combination. When I first heard that Nick Cave and Kylie Minogue were play, playing together, oh, I was quite stunned when, when they did what they did and it worked. And she toured on the big day out um, with Nick Cave and she only came on for the one song mm -hmm. and she had a ball doing it. He changed her world in many, many ways. Some ways we shouldn't talk about. Let's talk about Daniel and silver chair. I, and I, I think the thing about Daniel is people forget that that photo there He's 15 years old, which is like uh, that's in Newcastle. In Newcastle, mm -hmm. and that's uh, yeah, innocent criminals into they win the uh, uh, the band competition, and they just developed into such a great band. And particularly Daniel, he had so many great ideas. He is obviously very special, and he's a great artist. Take us with this photo, which that's I believe is taken pretty close to where we are right now. It is indeed. That's the Paddington RSL, literally across the road. <laughs> it's hard to believe, but that was a venue for a long, long time. But there, it was actually a really good room, and uh, yeah, Henry played there. The Paddington Town Hall, Radio Bourbon's 1979 gig, infamous, infamous. I think that's when mainstream Sydney got that this punk Radio Bourbon were special and they sort of like got it and went, wow. Well, we are in the bowels of the iconic Paddington Town Hall in the Reservoir Room with Mr. Tony Mott. Cheers, mate. Thank you so much for coming. Chin, chin. You are welcome anytime. time. <laughs>